This morning I'm going to finally conclude my message on another Jesus. Uh, what began as a sermon with three points uh, turned into a three-part series. But that's okay because this is a very important issue to understand. And actually we can go on and on with this and study this out even further. Um, we've been considering how Satan, the great deceiver, promotes a counterfeit Jesus along with uh, another gospel, another spirit. He has another Bible, another church, all of that. And uh, Satan is in religion. 2 Corinthians 11, we've been starting here for uh, these messages. Verse 3, Paul said, But I fear, <clears throat> lest by any means... As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, you go back in Genesis 3 and you see that same strategy, he still goes with it to this day. It's all about casting doubt on God's word. Once people do that, once they listen to those doubts about what God said, then they're open for the devil's lies. And you can study how he deceived the woman, and you see the same strategy holds today. And he's still doing that because it's effective, sadly. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds, and that's the battlefield in spiritual warfare, your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached... So, I mean, obviously, then there are people out there preaching a so-called Jesus that doesn't line up with the true Lord Jesus Christ as revealed in his word. Or if you receive another spirit, people talk about, well, the spirit really moved. Yeah, which one are you talking about? There's, there's all kind of spirits out there. Paul warned about seducing spirits that are promoting doctrines of devils, which you have not received, or another gospel... And you can always spot a counterfeit gospel because it adds works. The gospel, the grace of God by which we're saved is how Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and it's finished. There's nothing you can add to that. We're saved by grace through faith plus nothing. But when people put works on it and say, well, you got to be baptized or you got to this or you got to that, and they want to add works, they're, they're perverting the gospel. You might, uh, he said, what you have not accepted, you might well bear with them. So I'm not going to expound in these verses. We've talked about them already in the first two messages, but I'm just starting there to show this danger that there is such a thing as a, another Jesus, as in counterfeit. And so Satan is in religion, and that is the mystery of iniquity. Paul warned about in 2 Thessalonians 2, and we're going to see that in just a little bit when we go to that passage but this mystery of iniquity, and by the way, the new, the new versions call it lawlessness instead of iniquity. That's totally wrong. They, they change that, and, 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 and in so doing, they, they are hiding something important from people to understand. See, religion is not lawlessness, and that's what the mystery of iniquity is, religion. There, in religion, there's legalism. <laughs> Uh, there's this issue of trying to uh, be as though they are righteous. In fact, if you skip down in verse number 13 of this same chapter in 2 Corinthians 11, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves, the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed to an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So they're trusting in trying to be righteous in the flesh. So it's not the idea of lawlessness. The mystery of iniquity is iniquity in the form of religion. And Satan is working that mystery of iniquity in the earth in opposition to God's mystery of godliness, which is sinners like you and I being made godly through our spiritual union with Christ as members of his body. Uh, there's a vast difference between God's spiritual church, the body of Christ, and Satan's religious system. A great contrast in the Word of God. You see these opposing things. And so Satan is in religion, and since it's God's will for all to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, 4, we know it's Satan's will to keep sinners blinded to the gospel and then to make sure that those who are saved 
never come to the knowledge of the truth of who they are in Christ as members of his body. He wants to blind believers to the mystery of the body of Christ, uh, to keep them blinded by tradition and doctrines of men. And so, sadly, he's successful in what he does, and the reason for that is because most people are ignorant of the Word of God, and therefore, they cannot discern between a counterfeit Jesus and the true Lord Jesus Christ, and I, and I feel bad about that, and I want to have compassion, but I have to say, that's their fault. You've got a Bible in America. I'm talking, I'm talking to Americans now. We, you can go down to the dollar store and spend a dollar and get the Holy Word of God. The Bible's everywhere in America. You can download it on your phone or whatever. You can, you can access it so easily, and you, you can get a Bible, and you can read it, and you can study it. So if you don't know who the true Jesus Christ is, that's on you. You can't blame the devil to say, well, it's all him. Now, he's working, but it's your fault if you let him deceive you. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2. The truth is available, and um, you can know the truth if you want to know the truth. And that's what I believe. As I have dealt with people over the years, I'm convinced that people who sincerely want the truth will get it. But you need to understand, there's a whole lot of people that don't give a flip about the truth. And that's the problem. It's on them. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. Now, on the other hand, he says also to fight the good fight of faith. You've got to have the discernment to know what to fight about, what not to fight about. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. And he's dealing with false doctrine in the context. And when people hold to false doctrine, they're only opposing themselves. They're not going to defeat the truth. The truth stands. But by holding to false doctrine, they're opposing themselves. But notice, if God peradventure will give them repentance, supposing, in other words, that God will give them repentance, which is what he wants to do. He wants them to repent, as in change their mind and acknowledge his truth. Repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Spiritual warfare is real. Satan's looking for captives. But if you allow him to take you captive, that's on you because the truth is available. But you've got to acknowledge the truth. See, And so we can't say, well, it's the devil's fault, the devil's fault. The devil's real. And, 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 you know, I, but, but yet he can't make you believe a lie. You understand? So when people are deceived, it's a sad thing, and we want to have compassion, but we got to give them the truth, and the sad thing is, is that sometimes even when confronted with the truth, they don't receive it, and that's totally on them. So in the first message, we talked about the unbiblical Jesus, and uh, that, that there is a Jesus that exists only in the minds of religious people, and he's totally foreign to the Holy Scriptures. And we gave you examples of things people believe about Jesus that are not true whatsoever. It's all in their head. Since they've been deceived into not believing the Bible's the inspired word of God, they then imagine that Jesus is whoever they want him to be. And the second message, we considered the non-dispensational Jesus. And now we're getting into the, uh, the church in terms of... Their, in the, among the... In religion, you got people out there, churches, denominations, they don't even believe the Bible. Most of these churches are filled with lost people. But look, you have saved people that are still deceived. <clears throat> if it wasn't possible for saved people to be deceived, Paul wouldn't warn us again and again, be not deceived. <laughs> and you got saved people who are following another Jesus and that, that, that we talked about the non-dispensational Jesus. If Satan can't get you to deny the inspiration of the Scripture, he will then try to deceive you concerning its proper interpretation. Okay? So the last thing he wants is for Christians to understand what God is doing today. He'll, God will have all men to be saved and to come into knowledge of the truth. There are people out there, they've gotten saved by believing on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but they've not come to the knowledge of the truth of what God is doing in this age and building the body of Christ. They're ignorant of that. And they, they say they believe the Bible, 
And some even try to study it, but the problem is they're not studying it God's way. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so because they fail to rightly divide the word of truth, they don't understand the difference between Jesus Christ and his earthly ministry to Israel and his heavenly ministry through the Apostle Paul to the Gentile world in this present age of grace. And it's the, it's the same person, the Lord Jesus, but there's a difference in his, again, dealings with Israel according to prophecy and his dealings with us according to the mystery. And uh, so Second Corinthians uh, 5, verse 16 and 17, 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17, Paul said, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we've known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Now, there are things Jesus said in his earthly ministry as far as moral principle that still apply today, but there's been some changes in his dealings with man. We don't know him after the flesh as the king of the Jews. We know him as the head of the body of Christ. And therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That new creature, the body of Christ, Paul said, Now to him, Romans 16, 25, that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. And now notice, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, how? According to the revelation of the mystery. So there's a lot of people out there preaching Jesus according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's true. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the Word of God. But there are things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that have changed. It's not what God is doing today. We must preach Christ according to the revelation, the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. And that is uh, the revelation, the mystery, in terms of what was revealed to Paul concerning this age of grace, what he's doing in building the body of Christ. I mean, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, God's making a difference between Jew and Gentile. In this age, there is no difference. All sinners who believe the gospel of grace are baptized by one spirit into one body, and we're God's heavenly people. And we showed you some differences. God doesn't change in his person. He doesn't change in his promises. He doesn't change in his principles, but he does change in his dealings with man. In our last message, we showed you differences. Again, there are things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that still apply, no doubt. However, there are things that have changed, and you've got to notice that. You've got to see that if you're going to rightly divide the word of truth. All right, so now we come to the final point, and that is the diabolical Jesus. So we talked about the unbiblical Jesus, the non-dispensational Jesus, and now the diabolical Jesus. What I mean by that, if you look that word up in a good dictionary, it's got to do with being possessed of the devil. And we know that there's coming a man in this world that people are going to believe is Christ, but he's not the Lord's Christ. The Bible talks about the Lord's Christ. Why does, it, why does it specify that there is the Lord's Christ? Because there, Satan has one also. And there's coming one that is going to be possessed of Satan himself, Satan incarnate in a man deceiving the world. So lost souls who follow another Jesus. Now, again, sadly, there are some believers that are mixed up in doctrine. But there's still, if all who are saved, when the Lord comes, we're, we're going to be caught up together. You know, in other words, it's not going to be a thing of only the spiritual believers are caught up when the Lord comes. No, all believers in the body of Christ will be caught up. Those left behind when the Lord comes. You Look, folks, there are going to be churches that when the Lord comes, they're going to go on just like they are. Because they're not leaving. <laughs> Because there, there's churches in America filled with lost people. That's not really a church. They call it a church, but church is an assembly of God's people. But there are churches in this country, they don't believe the Word of God. They don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. They don't believe He died for their sins and rose again. They, they're trying to earn their salvation by their works. There are churches in this country filled with lost people. And when the Lord comes and catches away the believers, those, those religious people... You know who they're going to accept very readily when he shows up? The Antichrist. Now, the Antichrist, we think of, well, he's just going to be this guy with horns coming out, you know, and a pitchfork and, a, and just looks evil, and he's going around just, 
No, uh, he is going to be like an angel of light. He's going to be super smooth. He's going to be, he's going to be one that, see, anti doesn't just mean against. It means instead of. He is going to be the counterfeit Christ. He is going to come. Now, his name's not going to be Jesus. I know that. I don't know what his name is. It doesn't really matter. People always get into this thing about who is he going to be? Is he alive? Right? I don't care about any of that. I can know a lot about him by the word of God, but I ain't worried about the Antichrist because I'm going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air before he's revealed to the world. So I don't get all hung up on, you know, let me say this, by the way. You know what's sad is that if you preach a message on Jesus Christ and the glories of his person and his work, there are a lot of people who aren't that interested in it. But then you preach a message on the Antichrist, all of a sudden, boy, you get a lot of views, you know, everybody wants, oh, the Antichrist, why are you more interested in the Antichrist than Jesus Christ? There are people like that. But I'm going to tell you, the Antichrist is real, and he's going to come, and the religious world is going to readily accept him, and he's going to be everything the world imagines they need. Look in, uh, and we're going to go to 2 Corinthians and just, or excuse me, 2 Thessalonians in a moment, but look in Revelation 12 and 13 for, quickly. Um, I've heard people say, well, the Antichrist, when he comes, that's just the Middle East, you know. Uh, it's only got to do with over there. The Bible makes it clear he's going to have a worldwide kingdom. You know what the Bible says about what the devil's going to do? The book of Revelation takes up after this age ends, okay? The whole book of Revelation is future. It's a prophecy. In Revelation chapter number 12, <clears throat> the Word of God says in verse number 9, and the great dragon, that's Satan, it, because the verse clearly says it is, was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan, now notice, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. He's cast out of the second heaven down to the earth. There's war in heaven. He's cast down to the earth. When he's cast down to the earth, what's going to happen simultaneously is this man of sin that we know as the Antichrist, he's just a man for the first three and a half years of what we call the tribulation period. But right there in the middle of that seven-year period, right in the middle of it, when Satan's cast out of heaven, what he's going to do is that man of sin is going to have a deadly wound that is healed. And the world's going to wonder after him. And it, it's like he has a death, burial, and resurrection. And when he does, he's not just the man of sin. He's the son of perdition. He's Satan incarnate. Look in Revelation 13. Revelation 13, verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. That's tribulation saints. There are going to be some believers that reject him. But you understand, that's a small minority. It's a small minority. Most of the world's going to worship the beast. And so uh, he's going to make war with the saints. That's not us because we're called away before this is fulfilled. And to overcome them and power is given to him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. That sound like it's just in the Middle East? No, it's not. It's worldwide. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Does that just sound like the Middle East to you? Now, this is a worldwide deal here. Whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Now, let's go to 2 Thessalonians, if you would, chapter number 2. We'll spend the remainder of our time over there. So, Satan's mystery of iniquity is going to culminate when he's manifest in the flesh as the counterfeit Christ. You, you need to understand the stage is being set for that now. Paul said the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Satan doesn't know when the rapture is going to happen. So he's always ready as it were. I, I believe he's had different men down through history ready to fill the bill to use as the Antichrist. And um, so the stage is being set now, but 
the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the mystery of this present age ends with the body of Christ being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Those who reject the gospel, the grace of God in this present age, they hear it and they don't believe it, they don't get saved. When they're, they're obviously left behind when the Lord catches away his people. And you know what's going to happen to them according to this passage? They're going to be deceived and they're going to be damned. Now, I've been warning people for years. I'm going to do it again this morning. If you get left behind and you've heard the gospel and you didn't get saved, you're going to hell. You're not going to get saved in the tribulation period. Paul's very clear on that in this passage. There's a lot of people that don't believe that. They say, well, you know, when the rapture happens, then people wake up and realize they were wrong and then they're going to get saved. And they're going to... If you wouldn't receive the love of the truth, Paul's going to make it clear the devil's going to He's going to deceive you and God's going to allow it because that's his judgment on you because he's going to give you what you wanted. You didn't want the truth, you're going to believe the lie. And so the people who were saved in the tribulation period are not going to be people who heard the gospel of the grace of God and rejected it. They're going to be people who never heard it and they're going to be Jews that get saved under the gospel of the kingdom. It's going to be a different dispensation altogether. Okay, so the Bible has much to say about the Antichrist. In 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul talks about him. And um, if you if you want to understand about the Antichrist, you know, the two main books to go to, of course, is Daniel and Revelation. But Paul has quite a bit to say in this passage. And really, all all through the prophetic scriptures, you can learn a lot of things. And we're not going to run all those details. By my count, there are 18 types of the Antichrist in the Bible. You know, you go all the way back to Nimrod, even further back with Cain, by the way, and his mark. (laughs) Uh, But there's things there where, just like there are types of Jesus Christ in the Bible, there are types of the Antichrist. There's 18, which is 6 plus 6 plus (laughs) 6, and that's his number, right? 666. 6 is the number of man. It's going to be the best man can produce. In other words the superman, so to speak, but again, he is a counterfeit, and God's number is seven, man's number is six, he falls short, but you got that number of the beast, there are 26 different names, 26 different names and titles of the Antichrist, which is 13 times two, and that number 13 is associated with the Antichrist, and so there's a lot you can look at, but so the Bible warns. The Bible's been warning for so long about this one that's to come, and yet when he comes, the whole world receives him as Christ. They believe he's God. He's going to sit in the temple of God and say he's God and demand to be worshipped, and the world's going to worship him. And yet they, they could know, they could know he is the Antichrist. They could know he's a counterfeit. They can know the deception if they would get in God's word. But what's the problem? People don't get in God's word. So the Bible has them pegged. The Bible has them described to a T so that the godly remnant in the tribulation will be able to identify him and reject him. But it's just a remnant that believes the word of God. That's why the world receives him. So the church at Thessalonica was being troubled from without by a fierce persecution they were dealing with, but also from within because of false teachers among them. And so in, in Paul's first epistle to this church, he emphasizes our blessed hope, the coming of the Lord for the body of Christ. But in the second epistle, he has to correct bad doctrine. And so... When you come to 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul's clearing up the confusion that was caused by false teaching, and the false teaching he's dealing with is the idea that the second coming of Christ is at hand. The second coming of Christ is not at hand in this age. At hand means it's right there. It could happen any moment. That's not true. There are things that have to be fulfilled. There are many signs. There are many things that, and prophecies that have to be fulfilled before Christ returns to the earth. The second coming of Christ is not at hand in this present age, okay? What is at hand is the Lord catching us away to meet him in the air. That's a different event. So they were very troubled because you can imagine Paul had taught them about 
the coming of the Lord. He taught them to be looking for Christ from heaven, to wait for him from heaven. Now, these false teachers are coming in saying, the reason why you're, you're being persecuted, the reason why you're going through what you are is because you're in the tribulation period. Which would mean, it would mean that either they missed the rapture, or perhaps Paul, what he taught them was wrong. Either way, they're very troubled. <laughs> okay? And so they think they're in the tribulation period, and the return of Christ is at hand. So you know what happened in this church? They lost their blessed hope. Compare two verses in 2 Thessalonians 1.3 and 2 Thessalonians 1.3. Compare these two verses. In 1 Thessalonians 1.3, Paul said, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. This was a great church. I mean, they, they not only had work, they had a work of faith. They not only had labor, they had a labor of love. They not only had patience, they had patience of hope. It was the quality that God wants. But notice what happens in 2 Thessalonians 1.3. We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren. I mean, they're still on the right track, but there's issues now that have to be dealt with. And notice, as it is meet, because your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. What's missing in the verse? In 2 Thessalonians 1.3 compared to 1 Thessalonians 1.3. Do you see what's missing there? What doesn't he mention? He doesn't mention their hope because they lost it. In other words, it wasn't because they listened to false doctrine, they, they, they didn't have that hope in their heart like they, 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 they should. And so this is the problem in 2 Thessalonians. So they were listening to teachers who were saying things that didn't line up with Paul's teaching. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1, uh, 2, 7, consider what I say and the Lord give the understanding in all things. But they were listening to other men who were saying something different from Paul. And as a result, false doctrine comes in and troubles the hearts and minds of God's people. In 2 Thessalonians 2, notice how it opens the chapter opens and closes. It opens with verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So they were being shaken in mind and troubled because they were being taught the day of Christ is at hand, which was false. That's not, that's not the truth, and Paul's going to correct that. Once he corrects it, how does he end the chapter? Once he corrects the false doctrine and gives them the sound doctrine, now he says, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation, good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. The effect of false doctrine when you take it in and believe it is you are shaken in mind and troubled. The effect of sound doctrine when you take it in and believe it is your heart is comforted and you're established. You see the difference? It matters what you believe. The emphasis is on doctrine. Okay? It matters because what you believe will determine how you live. Now, they were dealing with tribulation. In 2 Thessalonians 1 4, for an example, he said, So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. They were certainly dealing with tribulation. But they're not in the prophesied time of tribulation that comes on the earth before the second coming of Christ. Now, we're going to face tribulation as believers, but we're not going through the tribulation that's prophesied to come. Let me just say this real quick. I call it the tribulation period. I'm going to keep calling it that. I know people are 70th week of Daniel, and it's not rapture. It's our catching up. Whatever, man. I'm calling it the tribulation period and the rapture. Okay, you say, well, the Bible doesn't call it the tribulation period. Yeah, but it, it, it prophesies of a time of tribulation, and, 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 and so there's nothing wrong with, for convenience, just using that term. Rapture is not a Bible word, but it's a Bible doctrine. It means to be caught up. Nothing wrong with the word, okay? So I, I have to say that because I'll get three emails this week about why I'm wrong for saying tribulation period and rapture. I, I'm going to keep saying it, so just don't waste your time with the email, all right? So the thing is, the, the root reason for all the confusion abounding today, and boy, it is confusion that abounds about the second coming of Christ. So many people are deceived about this issue. They're confused about this issue. Why is that? They won't rightly divide the word of truth between the mystery of the body of Christ 
and prophecy concerning Israel and the nations. We're living in a parenthetical mystery age that interrupted the prophetic calendar of 70 weeks. In Daniel 9, we're not going to go there for time's sake. We've taught on it many times before. There, in, at the end of Daniel 9, it's laid out that the new covenant will not come, the kingdom will not be established on the earth concerning what God promised Israel until there are 70 weeks fulfilled. And it's weeks of years. That's 490 years. You can prove from the scripture that 483 of those years have been fulfilled. You can also prove from the scripture, if you believe your Bible, that the final seven years have not been fulfilled. When you understand what the Word of God says about those final seven years, that hasn't happened yet. Why is there such a long gap of 2,000 years between the 483rd year and the last seven years of that prophecy? And the reason for that is God interrupted that and put it on pause and revealed the mystery of this age. It's not an afterthought or a plan B. He planned it before the world began. It's his eternal purpose, but he kept it secret until he revealed it to Paul. All that's been put on hold. That can't come till we're gone. It can't come. It cannot come. That final seven years cannot come until we're gone. So therefore, prophecy concerning Israel is not being fulfilled today. And it won't be fulfilled until this age closes with the rapture of the body of Christ. Paul said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trump shall sound, the day in Christ shall rise, and we shall be changed. Now, he's talking about when, look, the body of Christ that God is building in this age is a mystery unknown to the prophets, revealed to Paul. Obviously then, obviously then, us being caught up to meet the Lord in the air is also a mystery that was unknown to the prophets, and, and it was revealed to Paul. So once you get that straight, you won't be confused on all this stuff. The people who get confused on the end times and, and prophecy issues and the second coming, you mark my words, they don't acknowledge Paul as the spokesman for the body of Christ, and they're trying to find the rapture in Matthew 24 and Revelation 4, and that's why they're all mixed up. You only find the rapture in Romans to Philemon. That's the only place you're going to find the rapture of the body of Christ. And so uh, most teachers do not recognize Paul's authority as a spokesman for this age, and so they mix the word instead of rightly dividing it. Paul deals with prophecy in 2 Thessalonians 2, but you know why he does it? Don't miss it. His whole point is we're not looking for these things. It's not that we should be. He's showing them you're not in the tribulation because these things aren't happening and they can't happen until we're gone, okay? We're not to be looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ from heaven, not the Antichrist from the earth. We're to be looking for the blessed hope of being gathered together to meet Christ in the air. Again and again, Paul prepares us and encourages us and exhorts us to be looking for Christ from heaven. He never one time said anything about us being prepared for the tribulation period. And the only time he deals with Antichrist here in this passage thoroughly like he does is to show this church, you're not seeing these things. These things can't happen right now. They won't happen until this age ends. I mean, he said concerning the times and seasons of prophecy, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, he said, you have no need that I write unto you. That doesn't concern us. That can't be fulfilled till we're gone. And so what you have in 2 Thessalonians 2 is a, a passage giving an overview of the correct order of things to come. You could also go to Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 to get a, an, an overview of the entire seven-year period leading up to the second coming of Christ. We're not the subject of prophecy, yet it's still good for us to study it because we need to learn the whole Bible. Uh, we, look, when you rightly divide the word of truth, you're not trying to get rid of any of the Bible. You're just trying to understand it in its right doctrinal interpretation. And the thing is, is when you understand what's going to happen prophetically and it's not concerning this age, you learn a lot by way of comparison and by contrast. And as I studied the tribulation period and what's going to come, I thank God I'm not going through it. And I see a clear difference. You can't mix these things. Here's the outline real quick. You have the beginning of the 70th week, a falling away first, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. There's a falling away first. Then the middle point is, then shall that wicked be revealed. And then the end of it is when the, the Lord comes, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. 
And so he overviews the entire seven weeks here. Now, here's the outline of the passage, and we're just going to read through it and comment in the last 10 minutes of this lesson. All I'm going to do is I'm going to read the passage and make some few comments. It's, I think it's clear when you understand the context. He, you have correcting false doctrine in the first 12 verses, contrasting our hope in verses 13 and 14, and applying the sound doctrine, verses 15 to 17. All right? Now, look in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse number 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, <clears throat> by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. What gathering together is that? Well, he talked about it in 1 Thessalonians. I mean, turn back a page or two and look in chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, how did he start this off? Notice he said in verse number um, 15, we, this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. That's why Paul said about this, I show you a mystery. This is new revelation. So when he said our gathering together unto him, don't jump to conclusions that's the same gathering Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24 when he gathers his elect from the four winds. He's talking about the elect Jews that are going to be brought into the land at the second coming of Christ and inherit the kingdom. He's not talking about... just See, what happens is this. This is what happens. It's called laziness, honestly. There's a, the word gathering... I could see gathering in Matthew 24. I can see gathering in 1 Thessalonians 4. Same thing. No, it's not. Things that are similar are not the same. Well, there's a, there's a trumpet uh, mentioned about uh, the coming of the Lord. Paul mentions a trumpet. Same thing. No, it's not. I, I've done this before. I don't have time to elaborate on all the details now. But you can take everything prophecy says about the second coming and put it in one column. You can take everything Paul wrote about the rapture of the body of Christ and put it in another column. And you're insane if you think that's the same event. Because there, the points of contrast are many. There's more in contrast than similar. And just because they have some similar points doesn't mean it's the same event. And so he said... Are gathering together unto him. Verse 2, 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, that you be not sh soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as at the day of Christ is at hand. So, this false doctrine, because they were listening to it and believing it, it was giving them a shaken mind and a troubled heart. And, and, he, and he talks about, in verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. Now, there are different means Satan will use to deceive people, and you have three of them in verse 2. Spirit, as in seducing spirits, evil spirits working through false preachers. Word, as in the word of false preachers. And letter as from us, as in counterfeit scripture. Somebody was writing, a, writing to this church in Paul's name and, and giving them false doctrine. That's called forgery, counterfeit. Paul said there's a token in every epistle I write. He said that at the end of chapter 3 in 2 Thessalonians, and, and, and that's his name. Uh, his name appears first in his own handwriting in those 13 epistles, and so uh, there was counterfeit scripture in, during Paul's days. That's why Paul warned in 2 Corinthians 2, we're not as many which corrupt the word of God. You want to know why people are so messed up in their doctrine? Because they're listening to seducing spirits through false preachers who are using counterfeit Bibles. That's why. And he said in verse 3, let no man deceive, uh, excuse me, let me back up verse 2, because this is so key, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now this is, this is where all the trouble comes in with this passage for some reason. People have their own rules of interpretation. They say if, if, if a phrase or a word is used of one thing, it can't be used of another. Day of Christ refers to the rapture in Philippians 1 verse 10 for an example. Does that mean every time day of Christ is used, it's the rapture? No, <laughs> okay? I can give you all kind of words and phrases in the Bible that refer to different things based on what? Context. The day of Christ is not a 24-hour period. The day of the Lord is not a 24-hour period. It's a prolonged period. You can understand that by searching the Scriptures and seeing all that it says. So the day of Christ kicks off with the body of Christ being caught up to meet the Lord in the air because He reconciles the heavens first before he returns to the earth to reconcile the government of the earth to himself. 
So w- w- the day of Christ can refer to our rapture. That doesn't mean it always does. The day of Christ in this passage is what? Look at verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The day of Christ in this passage is the second coming of Christ. It's not that difficult. People say, well, day of Christ is the rapture here, so it must be here. Who told you that? Folks, do you understand? When I see the word baptism, does it always mean water baptism? No, there's seven different baptisms. How do I know which one it is? It's called context. The day of the Lord, for an example, is the second coming, but it's bigger than that. It involves more than that literal day. The word day can be used in a 24-hour sense or in a prolonged sense, looking at the context. You've got to be a Bible student, and just because Paul referred to our rapture as the day of Christ doesn't mean that's the context here. That's not the... It would make... Okay, look. Our rapture is a blessed hope, right? It's what We're comforted by these words. It would make zero sense for Paul to say, I beseech you by our gathering unto him not to be shaken in mind that our gathering unto him is at hand. The wording in verse 1 and 2 means it's two different events. Verse 1 is the rapture. Verse 2 is the second coming of Christ. They were being shaken in mind and troubled which if, if the day of Christ being at hand was our rapture, they wouldn't be shaken in mind by, or troubled by that because that's a great hope and comfort. Not only that, Paul taught in Romans 13 and Philippians 4 that the coming of the Lord for the church is at hand. But this day is not at hand. Two different things. You see? And so um, it, it would make no sense at all I mean, if, 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 if the day of Christ in verse 2 is our rapture, that would mean what Paul says here makes no sense. Follow that. Why would he say, I'm beseeching you by our rapture not to be troubled that our rapture is at hand? That, that, that is ridiculous. That, it, 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 he's beseeching by the truth that we're going to be caught up and gathered unto him that they need to be looking for that and not the day of Christ in verse 2 referring to the second coming of Christ to the earth in judgment. That is not at hand. I hope you get that. I mean, folks, people make things hard on themselves because they come up with their own rules of interpretation. Just because day of Christ is used of the rapture doesn't mean that's what Paul's talking about here. It's not what he's talking about here based on the context. Verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. There are no signs for our rapture. It could happen any moment. It's at hand. Romans 13, Philippians 4, verse 5. So, the falling away is not talking about apostasy in this age. Apostasy in this age started before Paul died. The falling away, how, what? marks the beginning of the seven years, the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation period. How is that reckoned? How does that begin when Israel makes a covenant with the Antichrist, believing that he is, that they're deceived? They enter into a seven-year covenant, Daniel 9. That's what, the rapture does not begin the 70th week. There could very well be a gap of time between the rapture and the 70th week. What begins the 70th week is when Israel falls away and makes a covenant with Antichrist. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth, and by the way, man of sin, son of perdition. So he's not, the Antichrist is not just a system. It's not just a religious political system. It is, he's a real man. The man of sin, the son of perdition. There have been many antichrists that have an antichrist spirit through history, but there's coming the man of sin, the son of perdition, and he opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So that's his ambition. That's what it's all about for him. This is a one-world religion that's coming with a one-world government and economy. And by the way, if he's going to sit in the temple, it has to be rebuilt, right? And by the way, it, in today's, in this day and age, it won't take long to build it. Furthermore, did you realize the tabernacle was called a temple in 1 Samuel? 
And did you realize in Acts 15 it talks about the tabernacle of David being set up so that it could very well be the tabernacle that's erected and not it, the tabernacle in the Bible is called a temple. It could be the tabernacle that's set up that could take, you know, like 24 hours. So anyway, he's going to sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. That's the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet. All right, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. How come this can't happen yet? What's withholding that from happening? It's called the mystery of of this age. The dispensation of the mystery revealed to Paul is what is withholding this from happening. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and boy, it's been working a long time, going back to Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. It's Satan's religious system, and it's working, but it can't culminate yet, because only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That he is the body of Christ. That's called the mystery of godliness. God's mystery of godliness is, is hindering the mystery of iniquity from being fulfilled. We'll be taken out of the way when the Lord catches us up to meet him in the air, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Boy, there's a lot of things you need to understand about that, but I would just say the charismatic movement's the forerunner for the Antichrist. Charism the charismatic move movement is of the devil. It's conditioned the world to receive a man based on experience and so-called signs and wonders without truth. And, and the world's ripe for it. He comes with power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because why? They receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So that's their choice. That refutes Calvinism right there. They had a choice. They could have received the love of the truth, but they didn't. Why? Because they, they don't love the truth. They love unrighteousness. And Jesus, look, in John 3 it says, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. There are people who reject the truth and they don't get saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. He's going to give them what they want. There are many verses in the Bible that show that God will do that in judgment. They want a lie, he'll let them have the lie. They didn't receive the love of the truth in this age of grace, so when, when we're taken out of the way, when the believers are gone and the Antichrist comes, they're gonna be, they're, it's going to be a strong delusion that they're going to believe. They're going to believe he's God. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. They should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But, now here's contrasting our hope. We are bound... We are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath cho uh, from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification and belief of the truth. Salvation from the events he just described that's coming. We're not going to go through it because we're going to be caught up. The salvation here is our rapture because in the next verse he talks about obtaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's when we're glorified. We're saved from the wrath to come. Romans 5, 9. You know, Romans 13, 11, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. We're saved from that wrath to come. We're saved when the Lord comes and catches us away. Now, how did he choose us? Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. We are set apart as members of the body of Christ, baptized by one Spirit and one body, when we believe the gospel of the grace of God. And from the beginning of your salvation, you're chosen not to go through that time. You're going to be saved from that because you're in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not going through any part of that time period that's prophesied to come because we're the mystery. And so the chosen to salvation, how do you get chosen to salvation? You get chosen when you choose to believe. Once you believe, then you're, you're chosen in Christ, and the salvation here is the rapture. It's through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. See, when we believe Paul's gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, we're set apart in, this, in the body of Christ, we're going to be called away before these things happen. And we're going to be obtaining the, the, of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, all right, you can't go through that. Those things are not appointed to us. We're going to be caught up first. Then those things will be fulfilled. Once you get this straight, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught. A tradition is simply something delivered to be kept. There are traditions of men we ought to reject because they're contrary to the word. But there are traditions Paul wrote by inspiration in his epistles that we are to keep. Our blessed hope is one of them. 
and stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. See, when you get the truth, when you believe sound doctrine, it makes all the difference in your life. And I want to say, in, in conclusion, what we need to be doing in 2023, in this new year, is what we've been doing. We ought to be looking for that blessed hope. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm not looking for the signs of the times, because this is not the times of the signs. I'm not all worried and worked up about the new world order, because I can't keep it from coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's, being, it's, it's working now, and it's going to be fulfilled. But praise the Lord... We've been chosen to salvation. We're not going through that. This age is going to end suddenly when we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Then these things will be fulfilled. So those who follow another Jesus and they're trusting in their own works and they've rejected the gospel, the grace of God, when they're left behind, they're going to believe a lie, the lie of the Antichrist. So people need to get saved now. And when there is a sense of urgency about the work of the ministry because this age could end any moment with the Lord catching away the body of Christ. Father, help us to understand these things as we studied them in your word this morning. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth. Thank you for that blessed hope, and it could be today. I pray you bless the service to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, take a break.